Welcome to the Dog Classroom. The Dog Classroom Podcast. I am your co-host, Anne-Marie. And I'm your co-host, Amelia. Like and subscribe on Spotify and YouTube in video format. And now into the episode. Here we go. Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Dog Classroom Podcast. This week, I have a special guest with me. This is Julia MacArthur. She is a a social worker, and she's going to chat with us about uh, the other end of the leash, the human half. (laughs) And uh, why don't you introduce yourself and just tell the listeners a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So, uh, hi, my name is Julia MacArthur. I use she, her pronouns. I am a social worker. I've been practicing for 15 years here in Thunder Bay and across the province. I work with um, adolescent humans and adult humans both. And uh, I'm also a dog owner. So I, mm-hmm. uh, I own two small dogs. I own a Chihuahua and a Papillon. And uh, they really bring me a lot of joy. So I was really excited to get asked to come and, and join you here today. Yeah, Julia and her dogs have been clients for a long time of the dog classroom. So um, we actually, we we got to know each other over the last few years, especially with Bijou, your older yeah. older dog who has since passed. But um, now we have um, our adolescent webinar that we do together. So this is not the first time we've, we've worked together. Mm-hmm. But I was really excited to have Julia on because I think there's so much that we get asked Um, As dog trainers, that is really, I always just say, it's not my lane. Um, I'm going to stay in my lane and I'm going to refer anything that is sort of those those human or interpersonal issues and say, maybe, you know, talk to someone like Julia about it. Yeah, yeah. So what I did was I went on our Instagram page and I asked uh, some of the listeners and some of our clients for the questions that they have about Um, I was calling it like your end of the leash. So you as the person in the relationship with you and your dog. So whatever you want to call that, the pet owner, the pet parent. Um, I like pet parent. I think you do too. Mm -hmm. Um, So I have given you those questions and we've talked about them a little bit, but I'm really excited to get into them uh, a little bit more here. And so I think the, the most common one that I had was about frustration. Um, (laughs) So why don't we talk a little bit about uh, frustration when it comes to uh, working with your dog or even just living with your dog? Absolutely. So like the first thing that comes to mind about frustration with like being with your dog, with training your dog, with living with your dog, with living with others with your dog is that oh, how normal is that? There's always going to be frustrating moments. Always. Yeah. Um, because like, first of all, you and your dog, they don't, you don't even speak the same language, like Mm -hmm. you're different species. And sometimes, you know, I sit there and I look at my dogs and I think about how closely I live with them and they are, they're not human and they don't understand my world fully and I don't understand theirs. So of course there's going to be times where you run into (laughs) frustrations, but I think that so much can change with the mindset that we go into interacting with our dogs and Mm -hmm. we go into training our dogs and then, of course, in, in addition to the mindset, the learning that we do. So I had a dog growing up. I, I don't know if we particularly trained him. He was a lovely little shih tzu named Charlie. Um, you know, I was a kid, so I wasn't really concerned about his behaviors or anything like that. Right. But when, when Bijou came into my life, I, I pretty quickly realized that, like, we don't speak a common language. And so mm-hmm. when we started coming to the dog classroom, um, the thing that we were able to start to do was like, I learned the skills. I remember having this moment in one of Anne Marie's classes where I was like, she's teaching the humans in this room. She's yeah. not teaching the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think getting that really, really quality learning, whether it's from, of course, the dog classroom is my favorite place to go, but wherever you're going to go, like with a certified dog trainer is so important because the more you can know about this little species that you welcome in, into your life, you know, the the better off you're both going to be. Yeah, and I think that's so true because even like, well, even us, right? We we do know, you know, what we've learned and all that, but we still have our frustrating moments. Absolutely. Um, I can think of just a few <laughs> last week when we were recording stuff for the podcast and I was a little frustrated with my dogs. Um, but we get through those, right? Because we can sort of talk ourselves through it and go, you know, my dog is, what's that one quote? They're not giving me a hard time. They're having a hard time. Oh my God. I love that quote because it's so true. They're, they're having a hard time coping with something, right? So uh, one of the questions specifically we got was I get frustrated with my reactive dog. And I mean, that could be an episode in itself, Mm -hmm. but 
if you're getting frustrated because your dog is having this emotional response to something. So they see the person or dog and they start barking and lunging. And if we understand that that's an emotion and that they are truly having a hard time, they're not just being a jerk, yeah. right? As a lot of people would think. Absolutely. So once you know that, it's a little easier, I think. Yeah, and that really speaks to that mindset that we bring in when we interact with our dogs. Because, you know, we know that our dogs can read our emotional states. I think that's probably one of the biggest reasons that today people have dogs. You know, mm-hmm. there may be some people out there that need, like, hunting companions. <laughs> but that's not, like, a subsistence hunting usually anymore, right? We have yeah. dogs for for their emotional... Uh, for their emotionality and their emotional awareness of, of our states of being. And when, we, when we're when we able to see that our dogs are having a hard time, maybe we can relax and regulate our nervous system and our reactions a bit because the more stressed out we are, the more stressed out our dogs are going to be too. And that really right. speaks to the mindset that we go into these interactions with. They're not always going to be easy interactions, mm-hmm. but the more awareness we have of ourselves, the more our dogs are going to benefit and feel more relaxed too. Yeah, and I think too, like when we get frustrated with our dogs, like you're saying, if we regulate ourselves, it does help because I know I've been there where my dog's doing something frustrated and they're amping up and then I'm amping up because I'm going, hey, no, stop. Like, you're embarrassing me. What are you doing? And they're not, um, you know, they don't speak our language. So Absolutely. it's and, really important. And especially when we're outside of the house or if we have guests over, I think those are like some really key times that we worry our human worries, our very human worries come yes. up. We worry we're going to be judged by other people. We're mm-hmm. worried people are going to think we're doing the wrong thing. Yeah. We're worried about whatever it is. Sometimes people really helpfully come up and try to give us advice about our own dogs. Yeah, that <laughs> rarely happens to me, thankfully. <laughs> but um, I have seen it. And I've seen even in classes, um, I was joking with one of my groups last week. It was actually one of the small dog classes. And uh, I heard one of the people in the corner going, you're so embarrassing to their dog. And everybody was just kind of laughing about it. And they're like, yeah, this one embarrassed me the other day. And it was everybody was kind of bonding over. We all feel that way. We do at times. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then I really think that part of that is that that practice of acceptance, right? So yes, your dog is a dog. <laughs> your dog is like we train so much into our dogs about like um trying to get them to be adaptive into our human environment. Like I came home today and one of my dogs had been sick and I'm Mm. able to laugh about it now, but they're always sick on a rug. Always. And it's never on the linoleum right next to the rug, right? No, it's got to be the expensive rug. It has to be the rug. And, And at this point, like I can just say, that's, you know, it probably feels like grass. They probably think that they're doing a good thing because it's inevitably on a rug. And and I can accept that now, you know, and I can accept that they're just being a dog. And so it just causes me less stress, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that goes for a lot of issues that we find embarrassing. We did an episode um, just uh, in season one about embarrassing things that our dogs do. (laughs) And Oh yeah, you would I remember be that surprised. one. That was um, we had so many people write in about the things that their dogs do that embarrassing that are just dog behavior, like sniffing butts and peeing on stuff and all of that. I'm not going to redo the the episode, but um, all of that is just normal dog behavior. And you you get a dog and you bring them into your home, and so it's important that we we do accept. Yeah, yeah. they are a dog. Yeah. Um, another important question that I think we got from a lot of people was how to advocate for their dog. Yeah. Which is actually becoming a bit of a trend that I love. I think I just ordered a shirt um, that says advocate for your dog on it. Um, and I think it's it's great that people are realizing that, but they just don't know how to do it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think that it's really tough to be assertive, especially with I mean, in different ways, it can be very tough to be assertive with strangers. And it can be, in some ways, even tougher to be assertive with, like, family members, right? Right, yeah. Um, So why don't we separate that? Because when I'm thinking about strangers, so I had a consult this week where the person was working with a dog who was a little bit fearful of strangers. And the dog is very cute. So the people want to come up and touch the dog. mm -hmm. And I said, you know what, if you're not comfortable saying, uh, no, we're training right now, just say he's contagious. And they thought that was pretty funny, but I'm like, I've done it, right? Say he bites. Mm -hmm. I don't care what you say, but you need to to get people to back away from your dog. Yeah. Um, I've had people tell me, oh, I put a muzzle on my dog when I go out. They're not aggressive, but I don't want people to approach us. Mm. And so there's all these things that people are trying to do to advocate for their dogs without actually speaking up. Yeah. Um, which I thought was really interesting. So what are some things that you would say to a dog owner who's going, okay, um, how do I tell 
Sally down the street that she can't come over and pet my dog or that yeah. my dog doesn't want to be friends with her dog. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think that like a, a being in a calm state of mind, that calm, uh, respectful conversation, you know, describe the situation, express your feelings about it, mm -hmm. assert that what you need and then reinforce it. Like my dog just really struggles with interacting with other dogs, especially off leash. I'd really appreciate it if when you come by, when you walk by our house, if you just make sure your dog's leashed up because he keeps coming into our yard. I'd like you to to not allow your dog in my yard. And and if you do this, my dog is going to get much more used to your dog. And, you know, they can they can say hi to each other from behind the fence. Right. And yeah. it's just a really calm and easy way to express that need and to be really assertive about your dog. But when you're out and about and it's a stranger, it's not Sally from down the street. Yeah. Um. I mean, I have a, I have, I have two dogs. So one who's like we call, we call our Chihuahua the family ambassador. She's going to go <laughs> up and get pet by anybody. She loves it. And then we have our Papillon, who is a COVID puppy. He did an episode on COVID dogs. We did, yes. Um, and she just has, she was socialized in a different way. She has a different demeanor, um, yeah. and she doesn't like to be pet by humans out in the wild. And so yeah. I always just say, like, I have the benefit of being like, well, like, especially when kids ask, you can pet her, but she's really shy. Yeah. And most people seem to understand that. Yeah. And, and if I, I was out, helpful. Yeah. If I was out just with Birdie, my Papillon, I would say that too. I would say like, she's really shy. You know, you can look at her, but she doesn't really like to be pet. Yeah. And I think it's great to teach children that like we just did our last episode um, or an episode a while ago that was about kids and dogs. Mm -hmm. And so having um, your kids know that it's okay if somebody says no, you can listen to them. Yeah. Um, don't try to dive around them and get to the dog. But also for adults to understand it is nothing against you. Right. Yeah. And I think that we can use this platform while we're talking about it to say if somebody asks you to please leash your dog or they ask you, um, you know, to, to please not follow them when they cross the street because they don't want your dog or you to say hello to their dog, it's okay. Yeah. Just let it go. Yeah, you don't need to say hi to that dog. I absolutely love dogs. I, of course I want to see them. And if I say, hey, can I pet your dog? And someone hesitates and they go, mm, and I'm like, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay. Have you <laughs> noticed a trend though in, first of all, children asking permission to pet a dog before they pet them? And the second trend that I've noticed also is when you're out on the trails in in town or wherever you are, this might be more widely spread than in Thunder Bay, people saying, hey, is it okay if our dogs say hi to each other? And now I've taken on that practice. And we just like check in first with the human. Have you noticed that increasing? I wish that I noticed that. Oh. That's not been my experience. Maybe it's a small dog thing. Maybe. Because it's often like big dogs with our small dogs. And our small dogs love big dogs. But yeah. Yeah, and that's great. I would love to see that catch on mm -hmm. and just go, hey, you know, can we can we talk about this before just letting our dogs run up to people? Let's make um, it a goal, Thunder Bay, to start this trend. Always ask permission to say hi to a dog or to have your dog say perfect. hi to a dog. I love it. <laughs> the other piece of this question that is maybe a little trickier, and I've joked about this before with Henry, we say we need to hire you to come on consults with us <laughs> because we'll get just, for example, um, you know, Partner A wants to do things one way and they've hired us and they want us to come in and show them how to do everything. Mm -hmm. And partner B says, no, don't want to do that. Um, the dog will get over it. It's fine. Or they have a difference of opinion on methods or there's some kind of disagreement with somebody in the household. Yeah. So how would you suggest that they approach that just in general? Yeah. Well, I mean, this is this is a big question, probably a question bigger than a podcast. Yes. Depending on the nature of it. I mean, what I would start with is a thoughtful calm not in the moment conversation you know if if you were to catch your partner disciplining your dog your dog in a way that you're not okay with mm -hmm. that's not the time to have this conversation right you know um when when everybody's like cooled off and everybody's like feeling calm have a conversation about approaches to to dog training and and you know what the research is behind it and what what they think is the best way what you've learned is the best way and um, and potentially like encourage your partner, the other family member to, you know, learn about the ways that you've learned also for you to potentially take on learning the things that that they know and see if there's some sort of common ground in the middle. That would be ideal. Yeah, I think the common ground whenever we usually come across this is that they want, you know, the dog to behave a certain way. Mm -hmm. And um, 
it's the disagreement about, I guess, how to get there or that I find a lot of the time people are saying, oh, they'll get over it, they'll grow out of it, which is just simply not the case yeah. most of the time. Yeah. Um, so what I would say usually is um, we can pull up Julia's website here. Book a consultation with Julia, right? I don't know what you call them, a consultation, a yeah. session. A session, a consultation, a session. yeah. And honestly, it's worth it. You can go to a counselor or I don't know what you guys call yourselves now. Counselor, psychotherapist, yeah. marriage and family therapist. And talk about your dog. Like, oh, it's absolutely. a thing. Yeah. Um, and the dog is part of the family, right? So it makes sense that you would go, okay, we need to be on the same page with this, just like you would if you were having a difference of opinion on parenting. Absolutely. Yeah. Or or yeah. household chores or, like, how to d- tackle handling the bills. Yeah. You know, any of those things. Yeah, because I find a lot of people want, like, they'll say, can you come in and, like, tell him this is the way it's going to be done and I'm like I can't do that like this is your yeah. family dynamic like yeah. I can I can come in and I can show you things and you can implement them or not and yeah. and beyond that I say that's not my lane absolutely yeah and and I think that sometimes disagreements like that it, it can be it can be pretty pretty simply rectified by clarifying and and bettering communication in a, in a relationship whether yeah. that's communication with like your teenager to communication with your partner communication with your parent if you live with your parents all of that stuff a counselor can help with me or anyone else, most other people <laughs> but you have the experience with the dogs yeah i do have yeah. the experience with the dogs that's true <laughs> um okay so so leaving that there still on the topic of relationships relationships with our dogs yeah so the questions that we got about that there were a few of them but mainly um you know figuring out like what is that relationship because i think a lot of people struggle like is it parent child relationship like what what do you compare it to well i've done some research because of the adolescent dog workshop that we do together in the into the nature of the relationship with a a dog and a in a dog owner or a dog parent. And mm-hmm. and it is really similar to a parent-child relationship. There are similarities there. Um, we're going to talk more about this in, in the Adolescent Dog Podcast we're, yes. we're going to record. But um, there's an attachment relationship that exists between a dog and a dog owner. And Don't miss that episode. Yeah. And <laughs> um, we're going to get into like some more of the details of that. Um, but just to say that there's a reciprocity in that relationship. And what I mean by that is that, you know, your dog gives you so much and you give your dog so much. Mm-hmm. I think sometimes about that, that they wait all day for us to come home. Yeah. <laughs> I was talking to my friends this morning at the gym and they were saying, oh, I look at my dog and I lock the door when I'm about to go to work for eight hours and I just think, are you a prisoner here? Right? Oh, I know. That's that's an entirely um, <laughs> different topic, I think, on pet ownership in general. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, I think it's important, like you said, that like they're they're waiting for us they're right waiting we for are us. their entire life we control their entire life so there has to be the reciprocity yeah it can't just be you or my dog like a prisoner yeah. right and you stay here and you do this and whatever it, it's got to be that back and forth otherwise why did you get a dog absolutely absolutely and they do give us so much you know like i don't i don't i talk about people's pets in in my therapy sessions with them because i i have an understanding and a lived experience about how important they can be for people's well-being right yeah um and and i know from talking to my clients that pets are often this huge piece of like uh, a protective factor a resilience factor for people who are struggling and mm-hmm. we all struggle sometimes and um i know i just reflect on myself and my behaviors and when i come home from work and i'm tired and i'm eating dinner and i like pull out my phone and i know my dogs notice that i'm not giving them attention yeah and sometimes they get mad if my phone is out and i like you know my partner reminds me now they just want you to play with them for 10 minutes they do and one time i read this i don't know where i read it but it said if you can't give your dog 10 minutes of undivided attention right take a look at why that is like yes. why is it so hard for us to give them just 10 minutes a day mm-hmm. of just just cuddle time like it doesn't have to be on a walk it can just be petting it can be playing with a toy any of those things mm-hmm. and and just sort of making them part of more of our our daily life and i know Anne marie and i have talked about this on other podcasts of like bringing them places and bringing them for car rides and and doing all these things with them 
but um, just to include them a little bit. Yeah. Right. And give them back because they give us so much. And, you know, sometimes it feels really overwhelming. And also we know that like so many of the things that our dogs demand of us, and I think demand is the wrong word. I think. Oh, that's a trend now too. We're getting rid of demand barking. Oh. Yes. Now it's um, seeking or something to that effect. Yeah. I think, so I'll, I'll reframe that then. Like, So much of what our dogs ask of us Mm -hmm. are things that also can provide us with really good mental health. Connection seeking, that's what it was, instead of attention seeking. Yeah. And, you know, that's what they provide (laughs) us with. They provide us with connection. Yeah. They provide us with the ability, if if we are physically able, to go and get, like, some fresh air. Mm -hmm. They provide us with, um, they provide us with, like, if we're really truly throwing ourselves into that moment of connecting with our dogs, they're providing us with like a mindful moment. Right. You know, and, and like that's what I think about when I interact with my dogs now that like this that. can be a mindful practice for me. I want to touch on briefly this reciprocity just real quickly mm-hmm. because I know that um, I too have seen a, a counselor and talked about my dogs from from uh, some struggles that we've had previously mm-hmm. and it almost can go the other way too where I was changing my life so much for mm-hmm. my dogs mm-hmm. that you know she had to remind me why did you get these dogs right was it so that you could sit in your house and not go out because you know they need you to be there 24 7 right so that was almost motivation to work on certain issues like with separation anxiety Mm -hmm. and i know Anne marie and i have had clients where we've gone on a consult and the person has said oh i'm really social and i love having game nights and whatever but i can't i don't do that anymore because my dog doesn't like people coming over Mm -hmm. and so to me that's like that's a welfare issue for you yeah you know we have to respect our dog but we don't have to put our lives on hold in order to cater to everything right we can do training to help them get past that yeah or we can put management in place so that you know we can still do the things we enjoy like it's not the end of the world if your dog goes into the kennel for a couple hours while you have game night with your friends yep um so i really like the reciprocity idea and just seeing that from both sides and going you have a lot to give your dog and your dog has a lot to give you. Yeah, and and really finding a way to have that balance. So going back to now your mindfulness, because we love this. Um, <laughs> when we do our workshops with Julia, she has us do a mindfulness moment at the beginning, which <laughs> I will admit I was not a huge fan of. I think we had this conversation. I'm like, I'm not a mindfulness person. Like it's a little hippy dippy. Don't don't love it. Um, but this graphic that you had showed us, uh, mindful or mindful. And I <laughs> love that. So why don't you talk a little bit about that? Sure. This is a graphic I've been, it's been kicking around, you know, therapy circles for so many years now. Like I've been using it for definitely over a decade. And when I thought of this podcast, I was like, this mm-hmm. is it. And I was talking a moment ago too, about the idea of that connection, that moment where we're undistracted and just connecting with our dog be- being a mindful moment. And, you know, that's all about tuning in, tuning into ourselves, tuning into where we're at and like calming our nervous system Mm -hmm. and then being able to like feel grounded and aware of ourselves and our dog and our connection. And it does sound hippy dippy, but it doesn't have to be magic. It's really just like go for a walk. Are you thinking about like what what your to do list is? If you have to go to the grocery store, are you thinking about going for a walk with your dog? Yeah, and I think that's the part that I enjoyed is that I was like, okay, it's not quite so hippy dippy if you if you do it that way. Um, obviously, you could get into different things like you mentioned, like grounding and all that stuff, mm-hmm. and and you can you can really make a mindfulness activity, you know, and set that as part of your routine before you go out with your dog. Mm-hmm. Um, I think particularly for for those of us with reactive dogs, it can be a struggle to go out for a walk and be mindful because you're just constantly worried and, you know, you have to be so on guard and so alert. Yeah. Um, so I actually find that we did a, an episode, probably one of our first podcast episodes about leash walking. I think it was like episode two in season one. Um, and we talked about decompression walks and it's where like you and your dog, you just go out into the bush and you just walk with your dog and don't think about anything and just enjoy it. And they sniff and you walk slow. And those are my absolutely favorite kinds of walks. Absolutely. I enjoy those very much. Yeah. Um, last question that we have to get to. This is a big one, and I, I think when I sent this one to you, we were like, that's that's a loaded question, is how do I know if my dog is happy, not in the moment, but in general? Yeah. 
Um, and at first my, my reaction was like, oh, do you know much about dog emotions? Like, I don't know <laughs> if I can speak to this. I know human emotions. But I started thinking about it and like, it's a kind of philosophical question. It is. But it's actually one that I ask my partner all the time. I'm always like, do you think they're happy? And so what I started thinking about was like, um, you know, there's risks and benefits to anthropomorphizing our dog and seeing them as human. Maybe define that for the listeners. Anthropomorphizing is when you put human qualities on an animal. Right. So our dogs feel emotions. but they, Limited, right? They also yeah. feel emotions in a different way than humans. Yes. Right? Yes. Yeah. And different things, doggy things, are going to make dogs happy. Mm-hmm. Um, so... You know, our the, our attachment relationships that we have with our dogs are going to be something that like bring them joy mm-hmm. coming home at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and then I was thinking more about like, you know, my training and like, how do you how do you reach kind of like contentment as a human and and fulfillment and, and feeling like a full person as a human? And I thought, of course, of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Right. Which I think we also have a picture of somewhere. Um, but. Maslow's hierarchy of this needs is, is, it. Here is we basically go. saying, oh, there it is. Perfect. You need your basic needs met before your psychological needs can be met. And then after the psychological needs uh, can be met, that uh, are met, you can, you can get into self-fulfillment needs. So food, water, warmth, rest, safety and security. And then you can go into finding belongingness and love, self-esteem, esteem needs, feelings of accomplishment, and then eventually self-actualization. So I was like, could I invent a Maslow's hierarchy of dog needs? And, and then I Googled it and it exists, one. of course. So can you pull up the dog one, please? Because I just think it was great. So similarly, you know, dogs need their biological needs met. They need fresh water. They need sleep. They need nutrition. They need shelter and safety and grooming. Um, and then their emotional needs need to be met. They need that security. They need that relationship and trust between like one or a couple of trustworthy caregivers um, and consistency in that relationship. And then they have social needs. So they need bonding with people and dogs and they need play. And then um, they include forced free training needs here, which of course I totally agree with. So um, management and learning and behavior modification as Mm -hmm. well as um, environmental um, modification to be able to make sure that they're- Yes getting you know getting getting trained in a in a good way and then eventually they need like cognitive needs their their cognitive needs met so like um they need problem solving novelty they need choice they need all of those enrichment activities that are so important to a dog feeling satisfied and and i'm not i'm an expert more in <laughs> in humans and dogs but i have been a dog owner for a while now and i, I would say like if your dog is getting all these needs met you're going to have a happy dog on your hands I think so. Um, and I think, too, to to sort of wrap this up but, but not cut off this conversation mm-hmm. is to say Julia will be coming back for another podcast where we're going to talk about adolescent dogs and we are going to get more into the attachment and the emotions behind um, some of the things that our dogs do. Mm-hmm. So definitely don't miss out on that episode. For now, um, I think we can say thank you so much for answering all these questions. Um, I think you did a fantastic job answering everybody's, uh, (laughs) the wide variety of questions that they threw at you. Um, It's been wonderful having you on. It was great to talk about this stuff. (laughs) And we look forward to having you back. Um, For all our listeners, thank you so much for tuning in. Don't miss Julia's next episode with us. Make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and uh, you YouTube so you can watch the episodes too. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Thank you.